So as announced, the subject of this talk will be uh, devoted to uh, Poincaré inequalities, sometimes also called Poincaré Wirtinger inequalities, and will consist of a, a brief overview of some of uh, the early developments around these inequalities and uh, towards more recent ones, in particular in the context of uh, probability theory and uh, geometric analysis. So these inequalities actually arose uh, in the work by Henri Poincaré, and more specifically in his study of the partial differential equations of mathematical physics, uh, in which he, he studied a, a problem that uh, he called the, the Fourier problem for the heat equation, which is just a, an eigenvalue or eigenfunction problem for the Laplace operator on a bounded domain with some boundary conditions. Here we will be concerned with the so-called Neumann boundary conditions, namely the normal derivatives at the boundary are zero. And this, this study of the, of the Fourier problem for the Laplace operator is undertaken in the, this paper by Poincaré, published in 1890 in the American Journal of Mathematics. And it was announced uh, earlier by two compte rendu notes. And uh, in this paper, uh, Poincaré, perhaps in a, a more modern language, is so studying this, this Laplace problem for sequence of eigenvalues and uh, eigenfunctions with uh, derivative, the normal derivatives uh, are zero at the, at, the, at the boundary. And uh, he's describing uh, each eigenvalue by the classical rayleigh ritz ratio using integration by parts. And uh, together with a, a kind of mean max uh, argument, although probably Poincaré was not so rigorous on this, on this point here, he was able to provide a lower bound on the K2, which is actually the first non-trivial eigenvalue of the, of the spectral problem. And at the same time, he was able to show that the sequence of eigenvalues uh, is converging to, to zero. So this is what we can find in uh, Poincaré's paper. Namely, in the first part, you have this Min max characterization of the first uh, non trivial eigenvalue. And in the second part, so this is K2, and in the second part, you have a lower bound on this uh, eigenvalue K2, which is given in terms of W, but this is a kind of normalization of the volume of the convex domain uh, you are dealing with. And the important thing here is the quantity lambda which is raised here to the power 5, and later on it will be improved to the power 2, which is actually the diameter of your, of your domain. And this is actually the content of what is nowadays called the Poincaré inequality, and uh, which takes uh, the following form. If you have a, a bounded open and convex uh, set in Rn, later it was extended to connected sets in Rn, and if you assume that you have a function which is defined on the closure of omega or some neighborhood of omega, and the important uh, condition is that it has mean zero, then the Poincaré inequality uh, compares the L2 norm of the function with the L2 norm of its gradient. And for this inequality, actually, uh, Poincaré provides a lower bound of the constant kappa in terms of the geometry of the domain, and more precisely, of the diameter of the domain. And here is a sketch of the proof of Poincaré of this inequality. The first step of the proof is a kind of clever duplication argument, which is taking into account the, the mean zero condition in this way. This, this is actually taught nowadays in all classical courses in analysis and probability theory this duplication trick. And then, together with a first order Taylor expansion of f of x minus f of y, together with a suitable change of variable, he was able to show that uh, you, you have this inequality kappa with a kappa, so comparing the L2 norm of f with the L2 norm of the gradient with a constant kappa that depends on the diameter squared of the domain. 
And actually, if one is interested into dependence of the constant kappa only in terms of the diameter, this is the best possible dependence. And only the, the constant here was not optimal. And it has been improved much later in, work, in a work by uh, Payne and Weinberger with the optimal uh, pi square for the constant Ca. So this is what is achieved in, in this paper, among, among other things in this paper, because he is also studying the, the Dirichlet eigenvalue problem. And this paper is also interesting by its uh, introduction, since, uh, as, was, as was already emphasized uh, some years ago by uh, Jean Mavin, in the, in the introduction there are a, a few uh, very interesting sentences, and in particular, he is uh, kind of pleading for rigor in mathematical physics, claiming that uh, it is always very difficult for a geometer to study a problem without solving it completely. And uh, he's also kind of uh, announcing, in a kind of uh, prophetic way, the fruitful future interactions between mathematical physics and analysis. So, as was mentioned to, to start with, these Poincaré inequalities are sometimes also called Poincaré-Wirtinger inequalities. And uh, this is in reference to the so-called Wirtinger, Wirtinger uh, inequality, which indicates that whenever you have a, a function on the unit interval, which is smooth and periodic, then again, you may compare for mean zero functions, you may compare the L2 norm of f with the L2 norm of its derivative. So since you have a periodic condition, this means that you are on the torus, and the proof here goes rather easily by a Fourier series expansion, namely that if you write such a Fourier series of your function, it's of course not very difficult to write the, the integral, to, to describe the integral of f square as well as the integral of f prime square, which are the following. And you see that due to the fact that f has mean zero, this exactly means this, this coefficient a zero is zero. And once this is zero, you have simply to compare those two series, and the only, I mean, it starts when m is equal to one, and then you get this four pi square as a constant comparing the L2 of of f with the L2 norm of its derivative. So although this inequality is actually stated for periodic function on the, on the torus, there is a, a very simple argument by symmetrization and uh, periodization that shows you that you have a similar inequality without any uh, periodic conditions. And in particular, those, this inequality uh, completely compares to the uh, Poincaré inequality, but only in dimension one on, on, the, on the interval. On, on, the, on the real line. So it doesn't seem that there is a, a specific paper by Wirtinger where this uh, inequality is actually stated. It is mentioned uh, in a paper by Hurwitz, and then much later in the Blaschke book about Kreis and Kugel. Uh, and there is also uh, another paper by Almanzi in 1906 where a similar inequality is presented. What is somehow interesting here is that Hurwitz is mentioning the Wirtinger inequality in connection with the isoparametric inequality in the plane. And let us just briefly sketch here this, this connection. Uh, suppose that you consider a, a curve C on the plane, with, which is in a parametric form. You consider the arc length and then the area A, which is uh, the area enclosed by this curve C. And uh, after a, a very easy uh, change of parameter, actually by the arc length, namely you, you change T into uh, basically S over L, there is a, a simple algebraic formula that tells you that uh, the difference between the arc length squared and 4 pi times the area is equal to this quantity. And the point is that, of course, this is always non-negative. And this is exactly the two terms of the Poincaré or Wirtinger inequality, uh, 
namely the integral of y square and the integral of its derivative. And if you apply this uh, Wirtinger inequality, you precisely get this uh, inequality, which is the content of the isoparametric inequality on the plane. It's worthwhile mentioning that this argument doesn't go through in higher dimension, and uh, we we'll actually discuss this later on. Indeed, the Wirtinger inequality, which was actually proved and stated on the torus, extends in a somewhat different direction than the original Poincaré inequalities towards a version on the sphere. Namely, now you replace the, the unit interval or the torus by, uh, by the sphere, the end, the end sphere, equipped with the uniform measure. And then again, you have a, a Poincaré Wirtinger inequality comparing the, uh, the L2 norm of f, provided it has mean zero, with the L2 norm of the gradient, which is the content of the Poincaré, Poincaré Wirtinger inequalities. And the proof in this case actually goes very much the one dimensional case through a kind of Fourier series or orthogonal expansions, this time in terms of spherical harmonics. And as mentioned before, this inequality now is no more enough to reach the isoparametric inequality on the sphere in higher dimension. It is interesting to mention that there are other examples where this uh, proof by kind of expansion along uh, an orthonormal basis may be applied in other situations. And here's one example which will be, uh, to which we will refer uh, later on. This is the case of the Gaussian or Maxwellian uh, measure uh, on Rn, which in its, uh, in its probabilistic normalization is described like this, and for which, again, you have a Poincaré inequality, namely that if f is a smooth function with mean zero, you compare the L2 norm of f with the L2 norm of its gradient. And the proof similarly goes by a Taylor expansion, a kind of series expansion, this time using the Hermite polynomials, which are the orthogonal polynomials for the Gaussian measure. And this result is, is quoted in a number of papers, but probably it was known much earlier in the physics literature. So, on the basis of these early examples, let us just briefly present a kind of modern language or notation to describe a Poincaré inequality. More or less, a Poincaré inequality is comparing for functions with mean zero, is comparing the L2 norm of a function together with the L2 norm of some gradient or some energy. And one way to, to put this together is to say that, first of all, we consider probability measures to normalize everything. We consider then the variance of a given function f in order to take into account the mean zero condition in the Poincaré inequalities. And then the, the whole discussion is to compare the variance of a given function f, or f belonging to a family, a suitable family of functions, comparing the variance to a kind of energy, which may take several forms. It may be given like this, using some operator, a kind of Laplace type operator, or it may be written like this, using some gradient type of operator, provided you have a suitable uh, change, uh, suitable integration by parts formula, these two things are, are the same. And this is actually exactly the framework by Poincaré, using mu, the uniform measure on your uh, convex domain, and then the Laplace operator for the, for the domain for the class of functions satisfying the Neumann boundary condition. Other examples included into this framework are the ones we just briefly described, namely the one on the, uh, on the sphere, equipped with its normalized uh, uniform measure, for which you have this type of energy. And another example is the Gaussian or Maxwell measure, for which now one has to kind of modify the standard Laplace operator on Rn by a drift, which, is, which precisely takes into account the density, the Gaussian density, with respect to Lebesgue measure. And again, you have an energy which is given by either the kind of operator, Laplace operator type description, or a gradient type description of this type. And the two things are equal by integration by parts with respect to this uh, 
to, to the Gaussian measure and with this uh, so-called orchnall uhlenbeck operator uh, with invariant measure, the Gaussian measure. And as announced, a Poincaré inequality is then a comparison for a suitable class of functions on of the, the variance of a function and its energy, either given like this or given like this. And whenever there is such a constant kappa, strictly positive, we'll call it the, the Poincaré constant. So it has clearly a spectral interpretation. This was the original motivation by, uh, by Poincaré. If you consider whenever these things exist, lambda 1 to be the first non-trivial eigenvalue of your operator, namely solving this type of equation, it's clear that if you put this uh, here into the definition of the Poincaré inequality, you get a lower bound of this lambda 1, the first eigenvalue, by the Poincaré constant. So, so this is a kind of spectral content of a, of a Poincaré inequality. There is another useful, although we will not uh, deal really with this later on, there is an also very useful interpretation of this uh, Poincaré constant as a kind of uh, parameter in order to control convergence to equilibrium. So let me just briefly, uh, so yeah, I forgot to, forgot to mention that in the example of the sphere, we precisely had that lambda 1 is equal to n. And uh, so one, one thing on which we will not really uh, uh, discuss more, but just to mention is that there is a, a, a very useful connection between uh, Poincaré inequalities and Poincaré constants and kind of rates of convergence to equilibrium, namely that if you consider, given your operator L, the so-called semigroup with infinitesimal generator L that is solving the heat equation associated uh, with L, in the reasonable situations, you have a kind of ergodic property saying that the semigroup as T goes to infinity converges towards the invariant stationary matter, measure, and uh, the interest here of a Poincaré inequality in this context is that uh, a Poincaré inequality fully describes the L2 convergence to equilibrium at an exponential rate on functions which have uh, mean zero. And this is a very simple exercise. You simply take the derivative in T of this inequality and you end up by the very definition of PT solving the heat equation with respect to L, you end up with the, the Poincaré inequality. So this type of uh, uh, rate for conversion to equilibrium has been used quite a lot in the study of uh, Markov chains. It has been used also in statistical mechanics on random rocks. And typically, if you are given a, a kind of Markov kernel on, say, a, a finite space E, you consider L to be K minus the identity. You define an energy, which is a natural energy in this context. And uh, what happens is that uh, the Poincaré constant is a way to control this convergence of the Markov kernel KT towards the stationary, the stationary measure. And uh, you can actually define uh, somewhat uh, quantitatively uh, time to equilibrium in, this, uh, in, this, in those models. And uh, what happens is that the Poincaré constant is something that more or less controls the type to equilibrium with this, uh, with this relation. This, this is not an exact, but this is just a kind of spirit of the relation that you get using the Poincaré constant as a way to control convergence to equilibrium. So we'll not actually uh, discuss more about these things, and rather term, turn to uh, actually the, the main object of this, of this talk is namely the, the kind of uh, applications, illustrations, and uh, developments around Poincaré inequalities and uh, uh, geometric bounds. So these geometric bounds are actually already present in the early uh, work by Poincaré, since recall that his first bound was a bound using the diameter of the domain that he was considering. Here we will be considered in more geometric uh, parameters or invariants connected with uh, Poincaré inequalities, and uh, actually the kind of uh, new developments here started with uh, the so-called Lichnerowitz bound in the late uh, 50s. So the natural context for this bound is the one of, a, say, compact uh, Riemannian manifold equipped with its uh, Riemannian measure, which we normalize here into a probability measure. And uh, when studying uh, Riemannian manifolds, of course, 
one is usually interested in two kind of uh, curvature features in order to uh, describe and analyze uh, these, these manifolds. And uh, the starting point, actually, of uh, Lichnerowitz's uh, investigation connecting uh, Poincaré constant or Poincaré inequalities with geometric bounds is a so-called Bochner is a so-called Bochner formula. And the Bochner formula is a kind of uh, functional description of, of curvature. So what you have is that you start with a Laplace Beltrami operator on your manifold, and then you consider an expression of this type for every smooth function on the manifold. And this expression actually may be developed into, so first the Hessian, the L2 norm of squared of the Hessian of F, and then you have a, a kind of tensor, a two tensor, applied to uh, the, the, the vectors, the tangent vectors, grad F and grad F, which is precisely the Ricci curvature. And this is uh, the starting point by Lichnerowitz in order to provide lower bounds on, on the Poincaré constant, actually. And the way he's dealing is simply the following. You, you start from this Bochner formula, and uh, you assume that you have an a priori lower bound on the Ricci curvature of your manifold. And for example, assume that the Ricci curvature is bounded from below uniformly by a strictly positive constant rho. So you translate this hypothesis, meaning that the Ricci term over, over here is bounded from below by rho times the, uh, the Riemannian length of the gradient of f squared. And then you have another term, which is coming from the Hessian of f, which is just a, a, a trace inequality. So that's, of course, very easy. And then, Lich then Lichnerowitz's idea is simply, let's integrate this inequality with, re with respect to the Riemannian measure. So let's do that. And of course, in order to do that, we use uh, integration by parts. Uh, expressed by this formula, linking the Laplace operator with uh, the gradients. And if you integrate this inequality with respect to the volume element, what do you get? This term here, if you integrate it with respect to the volume element, by invariance, this is equal to zero. And for this one, you use integration by parts. So what do you get? On the left, you get simply the integral of delta f squared, and the two other terms you simply integrate. So that's very easy. Of course, the first, the term in the middle is the same as the one over here. So you put it together. And then you can also read things backwards. Of course, it's possible to do it uh, quickly, more quickly than, than what I did here. But you, you can also do it uh, reverse, namely that this gradient squared is, again, by integration by part this quantity. And then, if you consider an eigenfunction, non-trivial eigenfunction associated with the first non-trivial eigenvalue lambda 1, you simply plug this eigenfunction into this inequality on the top. And what you get is something like this, from which you immediately draw a lower bound on lambda 1, the first non-trivial eigenvalue. This is nothing else as the Poincaré constant. And you get this lower bound in terms of the lower bound on the Ricci curvature and the dimension. And in particular, this is optimal on the sphere, which is constant Ricci curvature n minus 1, and for which you get uh, lambda, lambda 1, which is 1, which is n, which is exactly the uh, first uh, uh, eigenvalue of the Laplace operator on the, on the sphere. So this is a kind of prototype proof using geometry and curvature uh, of your manifold towards uh, bounds on the, on the Poincaré constant. And uh, this has been used more generally involving actually uh, any type of lower bound on the Ricci curvature, but then you have to take into account the diameter. And in particular, if you take rho to be zero, this means that you have non-negative Ricci curvature, but this is exactly the same as the convexity hypothesis of the, on the domain on which Poincaré was working. What you get is that when you have a, a non-negative Ricci curvature, what you get is a lower bound on the lambda 1, which is precisely of the type uh, that Poincaré put forward uh, 
in his, in his early work. So at this stage, I would like to come back to the, the two examples on which we, from which we started and from which we actually describe this notion of Poincaré inequality, namely the Poincaré inequality on the sphere with constant n, which, as, as we have seen, is optimal, and the, other, and the other one, which is the one with respect to the Gaussian measure, associated with the so-called Ornstein Uhlenberg operator, and which again produces a Poincaré inequality, with this time constant 1, which, by the way, is optimal. And uh, what we would like to do now is to try to understand how one can actually go from the, from the sphere model to the Gaussian model. And this is through the so-called Poincaré lemma. So what is, this, what is this lemma? So suppose you, are, you look at this projection from, so n is supposed to be large, much larger than k, and you project Rn or Rn plus 1 onto Rk. And uh, you denote by sigma n the uniform measure on the sphere uh, Sn, but now with radius square root of n. You take a set on Rk, you lift it to the sphere, and then you take the uniform measure. So here is a not so nice picture. You start from a set A in Rk, you lift it to the sphere with radius square root of n, and then you compute, compute the spherical measure of this, of this great part. And the Poincaré lemma indicates that as the dimension goes to infinity, so namely the dimension of the sphere, together with its radius, this converges towards the Gaussian measure. So actually, it is, this, this result is attributed to, to Poincaré by several people, including Mark King, referring to, to Mark Kapp. And uh, Mark King is referring to this uh, 1912 book, uh, Probability, by, by Poincaré. Uh, however, although probably uh, Poincaré, or certainly Poincaré knew about this result, however, the result is not in the book. And actually, it seems, this result seems to, to, be, to be due much earlier to people like Meller, Boltzmann, Maxwell. And it's very, very clearly explained in a 1906 paper by, uh, by Borel. So now, on the basis of this description, description of the Gaussian measure is a kind of uniform measure on an infinite dimensional sphere with radius the square root of infinity. I'm just quoting McKean with this sentence. With this in mind, one can actually go back to this picture by uh, Lichnerowitz, starting from the Bochner formula. Namely, if you start from the Bochner formula, on the sphere, the curvature is constant. So the Ricci tensor here is just n minus 1 times the identity. If you scale, if you consider uh, a sphere with radius r, then you just have a scaling of the metric of this type. And the interesting point here is that if you choose R to be precisely of the order of square root of n, in the limit, you get a, a, a Ricci curvature which is constant. Okay? And this is actually the game that you can play. Namely, if you look at this anstalt uhlenberg operator, which is this natural Laplace operator associated uh, to the Gaussian measure, and if you write the Bochner formula for this operator, this means that you simply replace the Laplace operator by L, what you get is this. This means that you get exactly Ricci curvature, which is equal to 1. And uh, this, is, this has infinite dimension, because in this Poincaré limit, the dimension was going to infinity. And if you let rho to be 1 and dimension going to infinity, what you get is 1, and you recover the Poincaré inequality uh, 
for, uh, for the Gaussian measure from this limiting, uh, as a limiting case uh, from the sphere. And this observation, among others, actually opened uh, the so-called bakri emery theory, which may be developed in a rather abstract context of a Markov operator on some given state space with invariant and symmetric uh, probability measure mu, for which you introduce a certain kind uh, of object. The first one is a so-called uh, gamma operator, which has to be thought of as a kind of gradient operator. This formula here is just a way to measure how far the Laplace operator is from, uh, from a gradient. And uh, in the good cases, of course, this gamma is nothing else as, uh, as the gradient. And uh, you have integration by parts with respect to uh, the invariant measure mu. Now, the game here is the following. You start from this definition of the gamma operator. And then gamma should be actually gamma 1. And then you define a gamma 2. So what is the rule for gamma 2? It's exactly the same as the one for gamma. But just you replace, each time you see a product, you replace it by gamma. Now, what is the interest of this expression gamma? This is exactly the expression that you have on the left-hand side of the Bochner formula. In other words, if you are dealing, for example, with the Laplace operator uh, on, a, on a Riemannian manifold, gamma is exactly equal to the Hessian squared plus the curvature. And if you do it with the preceding onstein ullenberg operator, you have that the gamma 2 is, again, this Hessian plus here the Ricci, which is constant equal to 1. Okay? And on the basis of this definition, you may introduce a kind of notion of curvature and dimension, which compares through, this, uh, through the, the parameters rho and n, rho for curvature, n for dimension, which compares the gamma operator with the gamma 2. And uh, in the model examples that we discussed on the sphere, the curvature is n minus 1, dimension n is n. For Gaussian measures, the curvature is constant, equal to 1, but of infinite dimension. And uh, on the basis of this uh, abstract framework, you may actually develop a kind of heat flow proof of Lichnerowitz's uh, lower bound, which goes as follows. You start with, uh, you consider the, the Markov semigroup solving the heat equation associated with L. You consider a mean zero function on your state space E. And then it's just a, a matter of writing things since everything has been defined suitably before. Namely that if you take the derivative of the variance, you get the gamma operator. And if you take the derivative of the gamma operator, you get the gamma two operator just by the very definition of the gamma and gamma 2. And once you have this, you simply combine this kind of uh, relations, the relationships between gamma and gamma 2 along the heat flow, together with the curvature condition, and uh, together with a simple differential inequality, you end up with exactly the same lower bound as the one by Lichnerowitz on the Poincaré constant leading to this Poincaré inequality in this general framework under this curvature dimension condition. So, of course, this is nothing really new in the sense that this was already done uh, by, by Lichnerowitz. But the point is that actually you may push this, uh, this line of, of proof and of investigation to some more general inequalities. And in particular, you may reach exactly in the same way uh, using this kind of heat flow method, you can reach more or less more general families of inequalities. So here this is some kind written in a general form through a parameter p, which is in between 1 and the critical sub OLF exponent 2n divided by n minus 2. When p is 1, you have the Poincaré. When p is the extreme value 2n divided by n minus 2, you have the sharp sub OLF inequalities. And right in the middle, as a limiting case, as p is equal to 2, you get the so-called logarithmic sub OLF inequalities, which have been used in particular by Perelman in his proof of another question by Poincaré uh, 
as you know. So, just to mention a problem here is that uh, we discussed uh, the fact that the Poincaré or poincaré wirtinger inequality actually implies the, uh, the isoparametric inequality on the plane. This is not working in higher dimension, and the question would be here to provide a kind of uh, heat flow or dynamical proof of the isoparametric inequality on the sphere, or more generally, of the levy gromov isoparametric inequality, which is comparing the isoparametric profile of a Riemannian manifold with the same dimension and the same curvature uh, than the sphere to the isoparametric profile of the sphere itself. So this is open. At least in a, a finite dimension, there is a version in infinite dimension which is, which is working. So, at this stage, maybe I just briefly mention that uh, there has been some very recent development uh, about a kind of synthetic definition of uh, uh, curvature or Ricci curvature or rather Ricci curvature lower bounds. Now, not only in Riemannian manifolds, but more generally in metric measure spaces by Lot, Villani, and Sturm. This definition, just to do it quickly, is a definition which is a definition of uh, convexity of relative entropy along the geodesics of optimal transport. And uh, uh, the point is that this investigation was actually motivated by the fact that, first of all, it extends to uh, abstract uh, metric measure spaces, uh, classical notions of Ricci curvature lower bounds in uh, smooth spaces, in smooth Riemannian manifolds. And it's also, and this is one main result, it's also stable by this limit, this gromov hausdorff limit. And uh, one part of the investigation is that this definition actually also allows for geometric and functional inequalities. And indeed, it has been proved by Lot and Villani that in this setting you again have a, a Poincaré inequality, although this is not so easy to prove, and uh, uh, it is open to reach, using this notion of curvature, it is open to reach the more general inequalities we mentioned before, Sobolev, logarithmic Sobolev, or isoparametric. So, in the very last part of this talk, I would like to uh, go back, actually, to uh, Poincaré's initial context and consider the so-called family of log-concave measures. So, what are log-concave measures? So log concave measures or probability measures on Rn, on the Borel sets of Rn, are measures with a density, with a log concave density with respect to Lebesgue measure, namely that it's given by exponential minus V, where V is a, a convex potential. And uh, if you agree that given a, a convex uh, domain, a convex body in Rn, if you agree that you take your potential to be infinite outside, this is a very easy extension of the, uni of the original, uh, original framework by Poincaré of uh, normalize the uniform measure on your convex body. And this family of log concave measures, they have been investigated quite a lot. So, yeah, this is the original context by Poincaré with the volume of the, of the convex body. And uh, these measures have been investigated quite a lot very recently uh, in the context of convex analysis and geometry of convex bodies, and I just would like to briefly comment on these developments in connection with uh, Poincaré inequalities. So if you have such a log-concave measure, the first thing that you might want to do is to try to follow the kind of uh, Bakri emery approach using a diffusion operator, so you consider the diffusion operator, which is naturally associated with such a, a log-concave measure, with this as invariant measure. So this is simply you replace the, the quadratic uh, potential of the Gaussian example by grad V over here. And uh, you may write the gamma 2, which is expressed in terms of the Hessian of your potential V. And uh, in, this, in this theory, if the Hessian is bounded from below by some strictly positive constant. This is an analog of the fact that you have a strictly positive lower bound on the Ricci curvature. Then you have a gamma 2, which is strictly positive, and then you have a Poincaré inequality by the scheme of proof that we presented uh, before. 
But now, of course, if you are only log concave, V is only convex. And if V is only convex, you have only uh, a zero over here, nothing strictly positive. And there is the issue of uh, what, what would be a Poincare inequality in this context? What would be a Poincare inequality for log concave measures? And this is actually a question which has been investigated a few years ago by Kanan Lovac and Simonovitz in a, a kind of algorithmic approach to uh, estimate uh, volume of uh, convex bodies in, in Rn. They were concerned with uh, uniform measure on the convex body. This has been extended later on by Bobkov to the more general context of uh, uh, log concave measures. And uh, one first result here is that if you consider, again, the question of a Poincaré inequality in this context, uh, which is what, what, what uh, actually Poincaré did uh, in his, in his 19, 1890 paper, as we mentioned before, what Poincaré proved is actually that if you are looking for the dependence only in terms of the diameter, this is the best that you can expect. However, Kanan, Lovac, and Simonovic, they were interested by another kind of geometric parameter, which was motivated by this uh, algorithmic approach to the computations of uh, volumes of convex bodies. And uh, a first result was that they were able to show that there is indeed a, a Poincaré inequality with something which is different than the diameter. This is kind of the variance of the, of the function x in, in Rn. And when mu is concentrated, to, is concentrated on a convex uh, on a convex domain, this is better than only the diameter. But this is actually not the result that uh, Kanan, Lovac, and Simononitz wanted. And the result they wanted was the following. This is a conjecture, which is the following. Suppose you take your log concave measure and you put it in the so-called isotropic position, namely that you center it and you assume that the covariance matrix of your measure is the identity. So that's something that you can always do by some suitable affine transformation. And then this KLS, uh, Kanan, Lovac, Simonovic conjecture, indicates that there should be a Poincaré inequality with a constant which is independent of n, which is universal. And this is what they really wanted, what they really needed in order their algorithmic approach to the computation of uh, volume of convex bodies is efficient. So if you don't like this uh, normalization in iso isotropic position, uh, you, you may actually rewrite the Poincaré inequality uh, like this. You multiply the constant by this quantity, meaning that what you expect is that the best constant is actually achieved on linear functions. This is what is expected. And it is expected that the constant is universal, independent of the dimension. We are very far off this. The best result known is of this order, which goes to zero. And uh, another thing is that this, uh, this conjecture, this KLS conjecture, uh, besides its importance uh, at an algorithmic uh, level, for the computation of, the, of volumes, it has also a, a very strong uh, geometric uh, importance related to uh, central hyperplanes. And more precisely, this KLS conjecture implies another famous conjecture, which is a so-called slicing conjecture. Slicing or hyperplane conjecture. So it has been proved recently that the KLS conjecture which is open, implies another open conjecture, which is this hyperplane conjecture, saying that if you have a convex body uh, omega, of volume one to normalize it, then the question is whether you can find an hyperplane such that the volume of the intersection is about of the same order. So KLS implies hyperplane. KLS is not proof. Hyperplane is not proof either. This is, these are the, the best known bounds on the constant in the hyperplane conjecture, proved by Bourguin and Boas Clartag. I think with Bourguin there was a, a log parameter here. 
using uh, various kinds of, of tools. And these two, uh, these two conjectures are actually still open and probably we are still a bit far from, from the solution. So I think it's time to conclude. I want to thank you for your attention and of course I want to thank Henri Poincaré. Question. can become equality. Yeah. yeah. There is a complete description. Well, there are, well, maybe there are, I mean, you can, oh, very often you can find functions which achieved equality in the Poincaré inequality. More questions? 